Well, joining me now is Major General Rupert Jones, retired British Army, Army officer, a former Standing Joint Forces commander. Good evening to you, General Jones. Carol, good evening. Great to have you with us. Um, this was a pretty lengthy speech by President Putin this afternoon and a lot of blaming of the West for what is happening in Ukraine when, of course, uh, Russian forces invaded. What did you make of what he had to say? Well, I mean, I think you're, you're right. I mean, it, it was a very long speech. It sometimes feels that he's kind of talking to himself. Of course, he was talking to to a group of people who are who are very much on his on his message. It, I mean, it, he came across as something of a fantasist, frankly, but but very uncompromising. Sets out this kind of his sense of the world order you know, of the West dictating uh, colonialism, global domination. Uh, but in his words, the uni unipolar world is ending. And he talked about the next 10 years being the most important decade since the Second World War. And he was he was essentially trying to galvanize the rest of the world against the US and, and the West in what he called a new world order based on law and order, which felt fairly rich. But as you say, Equally, a great deal of um, justifying uh, what he's been doing in Ukraine. And, and when asked about it, he made an interesting observation. He, he said that he had nothing to be disappointed with in relation to what had happened so far in Ukraine. And there didn't seem to be any hint at all of room for compromise or dialogue. It was all about how the West was playing this dangerous and dirty game. No, I think I think that's that's absolutely right. No sense of compromise whatsoever. You know, in relation to the Ukraine operation taking longer, he talked about yeah. You know, in the end, I will get that. In the end, um, very very clear sense. He said everything was through the prism of blaming the West for creating the conditions for the operation in the first place, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, nuclear uh, threats. He quoted. Our former prime minister, Liz Truss, and he, he was at great pains to say that he'd never mentioned nuclear weapons. He'd, he'd, uh, he'd never proactively, his word, talked about nuclear nuclear weapons, all the all the rhetoric coming, coming from the West. Indeed, he used he used the phrase there's been a lot of fuss around nuclear weapons. So it, fascinating language. And of course, this comes after the Kremlin accused Ukraine of preparing a dirty bomb, a, a bomb involving um, radioactive material. Uh, Russia indeed lodged that complaint at the United Nations, but without coming up with any evidence. And all the concerns amongst the NATO allies is that this appeared to be Russia laying the ground um, perhaps for some sort of attack like that itself. Yeah, I mean, it, certainly there's a possibility of that. As you say, no evidence behind these kind of claims what, whatsoever. Uh, I mean, they, are, they they feel fantastical. Um, and and I think we should all kind of play down that, that dialogue because in a way, by talking it up, uh, it helps create the conditions that, that he's seeking for some kind of uh, false accusation uh, downstream. And those comments came as Russia has been suffering setbacks on the ground in Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, continuing setbacks, as you know, Carol, I mean, for, for, for a number of months now, the momentum has all been with, with the Ukrainians. They made some fantastic advances in the north, some good good advances in the south around Kershaw. That's, that's stabilised, but, but it is quite clear the momentum very, still very firmly lies with the Ukrainians. Indeed, Reuters have just published an investigation based on some documents that they managed to get hold of from a, a Russian command post. Uh, and that, that kind of portfolio of documents highlights the degree to which Russian morale is, is very low, the, the poor nature of their logistics, the overbearing nature of their commanders, and how very under strength their forces are. Indeed, these documents quote one combat battalion being at 19.6% strong. I mean, when, when you've only got basically 20% of your forces in a battalion, you, you're no longer you're no longer a thing. You're just a rabble. Um, so, so there's no doubt his forces in the field are really, really struggling. And of course, that's the very reason why he takes this uh, tone when speaking to his own audience in, in Moscow. There's nothing to see here. Everything's going very well. 
because because he knows in reality that the the situation is very different. Uh, you mentioned uh, Kherson there. Um, Putin has claimed that his forces have taken Kherson. What is actually happening on the ground there? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you know it's it's gonna it's gonna take um, time to, to for it to really map out these. You know, the, the, after good advances by the Ukrainians, inevitably it's it slowed down. It's a tough battle. You know, when you look at a map, you never really kind of get you can never get the feel of the complexity and the and the scale of of the ground they're trying to retake. You know, the Russians appear to have rein, reinforced, uh, and indeed the Ukrainians have said themselves. You know, with with the the you know the start of the onset of winter, the bad weather does does slow down uh, the the advance. My sense would be we're in first a, a long, tough uh, winter in, in Kherson. Uh, and while we're seeing um, perhaps almost a stalemate on the ground, President Putin seems to be resorting to these um, strikes that we saw on power stations um, and other infrastructure um, designed to make life very difficult and indeed very frightening for civilians and of course even if his forces are depleted and demoralized um russia still has the weapons the capability to continue to carry out these sorts of attacks yeah i don't think it's anybody should be under any doubt as you say whilst the momentum is with the ukrainians you know the daily life of of a ukrainian on the wrong end of these attacks is is truly horrific um, and they they can come from absolutely nowhere. The, these attacks, you know, your, your, your normal daily daily life, and then then hell is rained down on you. Um, all historical evidence would suggest that attacks like this fail. They will they will undoubtedly make the Ukrainians' lives very uncomfortable. Loss of power through the through the winter. A great many Ukrainians sadly will be will be killed and maimed by it and have been all, already. And and the West should continue to call out this despicable. Uh, atrocities but but the idea that the ukrainian people are going to collapse in the face of this sort of violence all, all the historical evidence and indeed everything the ukrainians have demonstrated to us over the last eight months uh it, it, that's simply not going to happen the, the ukrainians are in this for the for, for the long haul and and they're 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 going to prevail um, let me just ask you about uh, the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Uh, we know he has already spoken to President Zelensky. He has already pledged Britain's uh, continuing support for Ukraine. Um, he does need to, to reinforce that with by action, doesn't he? He does need to continue to provide um, the weapons and the training, um, which comes at some cost, um, to ensure that Ukraine continues to have the capability of of withstanding this uh, continuing Russian onslaught. Uh, uh, absolutely right. You know, there's no doubt the Ukrainians have stayed in the in the fight because of international support, and of course the United States have been front and center in that. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. The United Kingdom has been absolutely vital. President Zelensky appreciated the support of Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson very, very much. Uh, and and it is it, I really do think it's vital that the UK continues to play its global lead in in this uh, in, in this regard. I think actually it's very important to uh, the new prime minister because it allows him to demonstrate UK's place in the world and actually reassure people that the United Kingdom is still the the dependable partner that we have historically been. Um, it's it's absolutely vital both for, I think for the United Kingdom for the West security, but I also think it's vital um, for, for the Ukrainians that, that we continue to give that uh, uh, uncompromising support. Yeah, and, and because we know that um, Boris Johnson, who of course um, established a strong rapport with President Zelensky, um, was also very proactive in getting other nations, particularly other European nations, to step up to the pl plate and provide more of the weapon weapons and the ammunition which the Ukrainians need. Yeah, exactly, and and um, you know, just one one I think should should view Boris Johnson through the Ukrainian lens, you know, slightly separately from you know, one's views on anything else he he may have done, as it relates to this this very very significant threat to to the to Europe. 
Boris Johnson was a very important leader. As you say, he galvanized other European leaders uh, to, to play the, the role that they, they did. A, a really important partner to NATO, a really important partner to the United States. And of course, that is a role that historically the United Kingdom has been able to play very effectively. In the last few years, with plenty of distractions uh, in, in Whitehall, the United Kingdom hasn't perhaps played that role quite as robustly as, as historically uh, it has done so. And I, for one, am delighted that the British government has taken taken the role it has in, in recent months. 